Hello, my name is Kelly Tebow, and I'm with the New Jersey Center for Tourette Syndrome and Associated Disorders. I will be your organizer for this evening and would like to welcome you to our webinar on Solving the Puzzle, Creating a Plan for Success Through Psychological and Educational Assessment. Before I have my colleague introduce the speaker for tonight, I'm going to cover some housekeeping items with you. All participants are muted. If you have a question, please type it in the bottom of your question box and click send. You may send questions during the webinar, however, we will have Dr. Ahern answer the questions at the end of her presentation. We will get to as many queries as time allows, and in addition, to tonight, tonight's presenter is available to take your questions on the Wednesday webinar blog, which is accessed from our homepage under the heading Programs. This blog will be monitored for the next seven days. Feel free to look and post questions as often as you like. Answers will be archived for future reference. If you missed part of the presentation or would like to watch it again, an archived version will be posted to our website shortly. We value your input, and in order to expand our webinar experience in the future, we need everyone listening to fill out the survey when you exit the webinar. The New Jersey Center for Tourette Syndrome and Associated Disorders, NJCTS, its directors and employees assume no responsibility for the accuracy, completeness, objectivity, or usefulness of the information presented on our site. We do not endorse any recommendation by, made by any member or physician, nor do we advocate for any treatment. You are responsible for your own medical decisions. Now I'm going to turn over the introductions of our speaker to Martha Butterfield, the webinar coordinator of NJCTS. Marty? Thanks, Kelly, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. This is the first webinar of our 2017-2018 school year. We thought tonight's topic on the value and purpose of assessments would be a good topic to kick off this new school year. Before I introduce tonight's speaker, I'd like to remind you yet again about two upcoming events. On October 1st, we are sponsoring a benefit concert called TS Rocks that's being held in Atlantic Highlands, New Jersey. And then on November 18th, we will host another New Jersey Walks for TS event in Ridgefield, New Jersey. I hope those of you that live in the New Jersey area will attend one or even both events. For those of you who can't attend, please take a moment after the webinar, log on to our website and make a donation in support of our programming for families living with TS. Your support is greatly appreciated. Now to the introduction of tonight's presenter, Dr. Lisa Ahern. Dr. Hearn is a licensed psychologist and certified school psychologist with a PhD in school psychology from North Carolina State University. She has advanced training in the assessment of ADHD as well as the assessment of autism spectrum disorders and learning disabilities. Her clinical expertise is in cognitive behavior therapy for children and adolescents with anxiety, OCD, and related disorders. Dr. Hearn also does parent management training for families with children who are experiencing difficulties with ADHD and other behavioral problems. While at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, she participated in a number of research efforts as a member of a nationally recognized team of experts. Dr. Ahern, welcome. We're delighted to have you present as part of our Wednesday webinar series. And now, without further introduction, I'll turn tonight's program over to you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much for having me tonight. I'd like to thank NJCTS um, for their hospitality. Um, and I'd like to go ahead and get started with solving the puzzle, creating a plan for success through psychological and educational assessment. All right. Um, I'd like to uh, begin just um, by pointing out um, a few things. Currently, I am working at the Center for Emotional Health in Cherry Hill. We also have a office in Princeton, New Jersey. Um, but my background is actually uh, 
in a variety of different settings. I've worked in hospital settings, in schools, um, in private clinics as well, um, and uh, specialize primarily, as Marty mentioned, in assessment of children with attention difficulties and uh, learning issues. Um, and I've been doing it for a long time now. At this point, um, I find that uh, really looking at what is going on um, for children in school, as well as at home, as well as with their peers, in depth and really getting an idea of what it is like for them and their experience gives us a lot of information um, regarding what to do to help them when they're struggling, um, particularly in the classroom setting. Sorry, I'm having some technical difficulties. <laughs> not sure why it's not moving to the next one. Uh, try clicking on your screen somewhere in the center and then using, there you go. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so just to overview what we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, we're going to start with when do we even consider doing testing? It seems like a large undertaking. It takes a, a long time to get all of the information. Um, you know, when is it appropriate to consider testing? We're also going to talk about why, what is psychoeducational testing? When you hear that big long word, um, what does that entail and how is it helpful? Um, we're going to talk about student support processes in schools. Um, a lot of times testing is one part um, of a continuum of services that can be provided in the school setting or may be provided in a private setting depending upon what the concerns are. Um, we're going to talk through the testing process itself. Uh, we're going to talk about outcomes of testing and creating a plan based on the results of the testing. Uh, we're going to talk about using the results as an educator. How can it be helpful to you as a teacher um, or other professional working in a school setting? Um, we're also going to discuss how do you explain the process as well as the results of the testing to your child. Um, many children come in uh, confused about why they're there and why this is needed and uh, we can talk through the best way to present that to your child. Um, and then what comes next for parents uh, after testing? How do you then use those results to benefit your child? Um, so I'm going to start with when to consider testing. Um, so who do I test? Children all the way through young adulthood um, who are in school, who are uh, either in preschool, going all the way up to college age. Um, most of the time, uh, those children or young adults are struggling in school with something, either learning or behavior or emotional concerns. Maybe they're have tru having trouble completing their work or they're having difficulty with their social skills and getting along and making friends. Um, and so when there are concerns, it might not be the first thing that we do in terms of uh, approach to, to test right away, there are a few other things that we might want to do first. One is we might want to rule out medical causes of whatever the problem is. Um, I do see children sometimes who come in and my, my primary concern is that they don't sleep enough um, or they possibly have a medical condition that could be causing their attention difficulties or perhaps a vision and hearing problem. So we want to rule all of those things out before we get started with the testing process. Um, also, we want to have discussed these concerns with teachers, the people who are working with your children on a regular basis, um, and determining what interventions have been put into place already um, and whether those interventions are um, working, are they beneficial, do we need to change something. Um, but if the teacher is putting in forth a good faith effort and we're still having problems, um, then we might want to see whether or not there is some kind of learning disability or some other condition that might be contributing to the problem. Um, and also, uh, in some cases, there are great accommodations put into place by the teacher, but we know the child would struggle without those accommodations. And so we start to um, look to see if those accommodations are needed because of a disability. Hopefully I can click to the next slide. Oh, there we go. 
Okay, so what is psychoeducational testing? Well, primarily it's an evaluation to determine how a child processes information. A lot of times when people think of testing, um, they think of IQ tests and, you know, what they mean in terms of how smart a child is, um, or they think of, um, you know, testing for a reading level. Psychoeducational testing really takes into account, as I mentioned, all of the different areas that we can be looking at to figure out how does this child learn and what are their strengths as well as their weaknesses? What are the areas that we can really capitalize on when we're helping? them. In addition to that, psychoeducational testing, at least in a private setting, can also result in a diagnosis such as um, ADHD, OCD, Tourette's, autism spectrum disorder, um, the, the big three learning disabilities that are called dyslexia, dysgraphia, and dyscalculia. Dyslexia is a reading disability, dysgraphia is a writing disability, and dyscalculia, you can guess, is a math disability. Um, when we look at all these terms, these specific learning disabilities and things like that, these are all possible psychological or developmental um, disorders that are potentially contributing to the problems the child's having. Um, psychoeducational testing can also help in determining whether or not children are eligible for special education, and we're going to talk about that in more detail, but that's when testing is typically done in a school setting, is when they believe that children are most likely going to need special education. Um, also, if you're looking for eligibility for accommodations in college, um, which is a possibility, uh, or extra time on the SATs, sometimes that's when I see kids for testing, um, and then also to determine eligibility for gifted services. So there are lots of different reasons for testing. Okay. I wanted to mention that 90% of children with Tourette's syndrome also have other conditions that um, can be contributing to school difficulties, um, ADHD, OCD, um, impulse control disorders. Um, and we also know that these disorders can really increase stress in children. And we know that stress then can exacerbate tics. And then we have a cycle um, of those tics being distracting for themselves in the classroom um, and, and that sort of thing. And so evaluating all of these different areas can really help pinpoint um, specific areas of need and then help relieve the stress for those children. Okay, so psychoeducational testing might include and should include most of the things that I have listed here. Um, developmental history and review of any previous testing or any records that we have on that child. Clinical interviews to look at symptoms of specific disorders, so we're looking for how often and how frequently those symptoms are occurring. Um, I like to do a classroom observation, and if you have an uh, evaluation done in school, uh, this is usually a requirement to have a classroom observation. Um, many private providers aren't able to do a classroom observation, um, especially if they're doing the evaluation uh, through insurance. Uh, however, I feel like it's a very important piece of the assessment in cases where behavior is of concern. Um, cognitive and IQ testing uh, tells us a lot about how children process lots of different types of information, uh, verbal versus nonverbal, short-term memory, processing speed, those sorts of things that then contribute to school difficulties. Um, achievement testing, I usually do, reading, writing, and math, as well as oral language. Uh, you might also see some what we call neuropsychological tests, that's a big word, generally that means specific brain processing or processing weaknesses that might um, be contributing, and we'll talk about that more in a few minutes. Uh, and also behavioral rating scales. So rating scales or questionnaires are completed by parents, uh, children themselves, uh, and teachers to be able to compare their behavior to other children their age and, and usually their other children their gender. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about student support processes in public schools because this is something that's very confusing for a lot of families um, or for people who aren't typically uh, 
really involved in school settings and understanding this process. Um, so when we think about services for kids at school, we really need to think about it as a continuum of services. And a lot of times, for many, many years, it was sort of thought that there was either you were in a general classroom or you were in a special education classroom. And there really wasn't a, a distinction um, or a continuum of shades of gray between that. Um, over time, we've uh, developed a process that's a, a little bit different. Now, um, typically children are in their regular general education classroom, um, but if something comes up that's of concern, behaviorally or academically, they um, have a couple of different things that could happen. Um, often, one of the first things that might happen is that children are referred to what we call a pre-referral team that is sometimes uh, referred to as at the RTI team or the MTSS team. This is response to intervention and multi-tier student support. Um, in New Jersey, it's often called I and RS and that's intervention and referral services. In other states, it's called the student support team. So it's always called something different. It's a team of professionals at the school that include maybe administrators, some teachers, hopefully the child's teacher, um, perhaps the speech and language pathologist, the school psychologist, uh, maybe the learning consultant or social worker at the school. Uh, so there's a variety of people who come together um, and the child is either referred by the teacher or by their parents. Um, and those people then problem solve. They, they gather a lot of information about what's going on with that child. They problem solve and try to come up with an intervention, hopefully an evidence-based intervention that will help that child in whatever area they're struggling in. Then they follow that child for 9 to 12 weeks, usually, for a period of time, uh, during which they collect data on how the child's doing with whatever the problem is. And then at the end of that period of time, they come back together and say, has there been any improvement? Um, and if there has been improvement, then they might be able to just kind of continue with their general education supports. Um, if there hasn't uh, been improvement, then there's a, a couple of different things that could happen. If children do have a disability of some kind, and it, it, it's either a disability that's been diagnosed or a disability that is a perceived disability, as the law states, they can potentially get what's called a Section 504 plan. The Section 504 plan comes out of the same law that gives us wheelchair ramps and other kinds of accommodations for people with disabilities. Um, and the disability has to be affecting a child's major life activity. And at school, that major life activity is usually learning. So if a disability, such as ADHD, for example, is affecting the child's learning and they need accommodations in the classroom in order to be successful and progress, then they might receive a 504 plan. And that would include the basic accommodations you sort of generally hear about. Preferential seating near the teacher, extra time on tests, um, breaks and the ability um, to take breaks as needed, breaking things down into smaller pieces. So there are an, a whole host of things that can be considered an accommodation that children will then get still in their general education classroom. Um, however, if those accommodations really aren't enough and a child really needs specialized instruction in order to really progress, then they might need special education. And that's the point in time at school where testing might occur because testing in the public schools is usually reserved for children who may need specialized instruction or special education otherwise known as an IEP in the classroom. Um, so the IEP is just the, the program and the document that um, shows what the child needs in order to succeed. So it will include those accommodations, the same ones that are on the 504 perhaps, um, but maybe more of them. It might also include um, goals that the child uh, has to reach by the end of the year. It'll include specific amounts of instruction and in what format that will take place. Uh, it might include extra services such as speech and language or occupational therapy as well, counseling. Um, so I'll go into a little more detail about some of these things, but in general I think understanding the process really helps parents to understand if they request that the school t test their child, 
in not in some states schools are required to um, test if parents request it. Um, however, in New Jersey, that's not the case. Uh, if you request testing in New Jersey, the school does have a certain period of time to meet with you to determine whether or not they're going to test, um, but they're not necessarily required to test. Okay. Um, so I went through a lot of this um, already, but I want to po point out that for um, the main differences here are that for INRS, uh, you have um, data collection going on, and this is typically happening before children get referred for testing for an IEP. Um, so a lot of times, even if children might eventually get tested, they often start out here uh, because t schools are required to try at least two interventions before they test most of the time. Um, and also, the difference between the 504 and the IEP uh, is primarily that the 504 is just a list of accommodations, where the IEP is only given if there's, number one, a disability, number two, it affects educational performance, um, it has to, the child has to be having trouble, if they're getting all A's, they're most likely not going to receive special education services. Um, and then the need for specialized instruction uh, also is the third prong here. So if we need specialized instruction in order to progress, then we're looking um, potentially at an IEP. Okay, so going forward from there, um, what is the testing process like? Well, it depends on where you're being tested. So um, in New Jersey, there's uh, the child study team provides the assessment in the schools, and the team is typically uh, consists of the school psychologist, a learning consultant, and a social worker. Um, in most other states, the school psychologist does the entire assessment, um, and there is no learning consultant or social worker involved in the assessment at all. Um, a speech and language th uh, therapist may also be involved on the team, uh, or an occupational therapist, if those things are also uh, needed. Um, a physical therapist could also be part of it, depending upon what the concern is. When a private psychologist uh, provides assessment, uh, they might do so in a private practice setting or in a clinic or hospital setting. Uh, and most of the time, the types of assessment I'm talking about, psychoeducational assessment, is provided by school psychologists who are licensed psychologists who work outside of schools. Um, but there are also some clinical psychologists who do similar assessments. Um, so, uh, we start out with the testing process with interviews. So, we're trying to find out from parents and teachers, what's their behavior like? What about their, and you see the term executive functioning there, that really refers to um, all of the processes that go on in the frontal lobe of your brain, right behind your forehead. And those processes are things like focusing on what you need to focus on and then switching away from that to focus on something else when you need to. Um, being organized, thinking ahead, planning ahead, uh, self-monitoring, so paying attention to your own behavior when it's happening. So I want to know how that looks in the classroom. Do they tend to forget their assignments? Do they not write things down in their planner? Do they wait till the last minute to do their work? Are they talking to their friends instead of listening to everyone else? So I want to know more about that in the classroom, but I want to know about that at home too. How do they follow their morning routine? How do they follow a homework routine? Um, I want to know more more about their emotional and social life as well. Um, educationally, I'm going to want to know more about their history of reading, writing, and math. Do they have any early problems in those areas? What's their memory like? Do they retain information or do they learn something and then forget it right away? Developmental and medical history is involved, any uh, data from previous interventions. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, a clinical interview that just looks specifically at all the symptoms of whatever it is we're looking for. Okay, so the classroom observation, as I mentioned, not always done with private evaluations. Um, when I do them, I like to do them during instruction, but also potentially during some independent time. Uh, and for some kids, if I'm looking at social skills and things, I might want to be there during lunch or recess to see, you know, the differences in behavior. So I actually rely on teachers a lot to tell me, what are the best times to come in and see the things that you're talking about? Um, 
and usually I'm just the psychologist in the corner. In many schools that I go in, there are so many people who come in and out of these classrooms that I just hide in the corner and no one really knows that I'm there or cares that I'm there. Um, it may be a structured uh, observation, like I might be tallying how many uh, times a child was off task during an independent task, um, or and usually both things, I'm collecting a lot of qualitative information. I'm just sort of writing down what are they doing, who are they talking to, are they following the direction, um, so I sort of have a narrative of what goes on during that time and I'll compare the the behavior to that of other students in the class. So, you know, if everyone is calling out and that's just part of how the classroom is, it's a little different than if that child's the only one calling out. Um, and then I'll want to also observe a little bit the teacher and see, you know, what inf what interventions they're putting into place and that sort of thing, how they're responding to the behavior, because that gives me some good ideas about what to recommend that might help. So the next part of it is behavior rating skills. So there are a number of those that are out there, and I listed a whole bunch of them here. But the general difference is that some of them are very, very broad. Uh, the BASC or the Connors um, behavior rating scale, or the comprehensive behavior rating scale, which is the Connors version, they cover everything, all kinds of childhood behavior. So when I ask people to fill that out, I always give them a heads up because some of those behaviors might apply to their child and some of them might not really at all, but I'm looking to rule things out. I might also have specific scales about specific behaviors. So if it's specific to ADHD, I might have certain scales. If it's specific to autism spectrum or executive functioning problems. So um, all of those things um, might have a specific scale that will give me more in-depth information about that particular area. And I want to make sure I get multiple people to fill it out. Otherwise, I'm only getting one person's view of what's going on. So, um, in addition to that, when we think of testing, we're really thinking of standardized tests. So, there are a lot of different kinds of standardized tests. I'm going to bring some of them in here. Um, and why do we use them? Um, a lot of times standardized testing kind of gets a bum rap from the park and, and the, the big tests that everybody has to take universally in the schools. But standardized just basically means that the same exact test administration is happening for one child as it is for another child. So I'm not doing anything special for one child versus another besides maybe cueing them to make sure they're paying attention so I'm not just testing so I actually am testing their reading and not just their attention skills um, but I do that for everyone um, so standardized um, gives us a general idea also of how this child is performing in comparison to other kids their age um, or their grade level depending upon which norms you have so you're doing doing this test and then looking at their performance in comparison to national norms um, and seeing, you know, are, are these um, are these tests, uh, you know, valid representations of what they're able to do. Um, you're also looking at um, comparing one test to another. So when you have tests that are standardized, they have scores that are very similar to each other and I'm able to see a 100 on a cognitive test um, is average um, and so a 100 on achievement tests is also average um, but if I have a much lower score on an achievement test than I do on the cognitive test that can be difficult because that may um, that may uh, be showing that the child has some sort of disability because IQ tests and cognitive tests tend to predict achievement scores um, and when they don't we start to wonder what's going on here it's not the only way of determining a learning disability to look at that discrepancy between IQ and achievement but it is the main way that many school systems use um, but really there are lots of different processes that underlie reading, writing, and math. Um, and children who have learning disabilities often have problems with various different processes. So we want to do some additional processing tests to look at um, their ability to sound out words, for example, or their ability to appreciate the sounds in words. Um, and I'm going to talk about more of that in just a minute. The speech language uh, therapist may also complete some standardized tests as part of the assessment, um, you know, if that seems to be an area of concern. Um, and the battery of tests that's used is always dependent on what are the concerns in this situation? What are the hypotheses we have about what's going on? 
Um, okay, so some example batteries of tests here. Uh, so for ADHD, I typically do the interviews and observation rating skills. I may do and, and very often do IQ and achievement testing to rule out any learning disabilities or just to be able to see the effect of the ADHD on some of their learning um, just in session. So if I'm watching them read uh, and they can decode words well, uh, but they tend to skip endings, they tend to uh, skip over words, they tend to um, become distracted in the middle of when they're reading, then I might be able to um, identify whether or not it's potentially an attention issue that's causing some of the reading difficulties as opposed to um, a learning disability in reading. Um, I may also do some neuropsych tests to look at um, executive functioning skills, as I mentioned before, all that organization, planning, um, you know, self-monitoring stuff, uh, or memory. Um, one thing I should point out is that no one of those tests uh, really is a test that determines a diagnosis of ADHD. There is no one test. It's all based on whether or not they meet the criteria for ADHD. That includes the symptoms. They have to have at least six of the nine inattentive symptoms and or at least six of the nine hyperactive impulsive symptoms of ADHD. Uh, but it has to also not be due to any other disorder. It has to be something that's been going on since they were little, since before the age of 12, not just since last week. Um, and it needs to be happening in multiple settings. It's cool at home, uh, potentially in some of their after-school activities. It can't be something that's only happening when they're reading. So all of that data is to determine whether that diagnosis it would be correct for that child. It has to be beyond what we'd expect for their age. So a lot of those things, of course, little kids do, but as they get older, more and more, their peers are able to control it and they are not. Um, then uh, looking at dyslexia or reading disability, with that you also do interviews and gather any intervention data that's happened so far. Many kids with reading problems um, have been involved in some kind of intervention in either their classroom or they have basic skills help and we want to see, you know, maybe they had tutoring. We want to see what kinds of um, you know, intervention has been done, what kind of data has been gathered from that. Uh, we look at IQ and achievement testing. We look for that discrepancy, but it may not be there. Sometimes, you know, kids might have um, an IQ that's on the lower end of average, um, and then they need, they would, in order to get a big discrepancy uh, between their IQ and their achievement scores, they would have to score really low on the achievement score, achievement tests. So often kids might be struggling with reading, but not meet that discrepancy criterion. So we want to look at some of the processes that underlie reading. We want to look at, there's kind of two sides to reading. We've got the, the hearing side to reading, the auditory side, and we've got the visual side to reading, the uh, what we call the orthographic processing. So the auditory side is called phonological processing, and that includes the ability to discriminate between sounds in words. So for example, the word cat has three sounds, k, a, t. So in order to uh, be able to read that word, I need to first of all recognize that there are three sounds there and they're three different sounds from each other and they're in a certain order. Um, and I'm going to have to remember those sounds as well. So discriminating the sounds, manipulating the sounds, and being able to remember those sounds are all very important. Um, but then I'm going to have to link it to these letters. So now I flip to the orthographic side. I need to remember what these letters look like and I need to link them up to these sounds. So I need to be able to retrieve that k is a C or a K, that A is an A and T is a T. Um, so those different sides of reading, we can look at those processes separately from reading with some uh, additional tests and I do those um, regularly when I'm looking at a reading disability. I also look at their ability to read words, their ability to sound out fake words, so we're not just relying on what it looks like but we have to use phonics rules as well as their fluency in reading, how quickly and accurately they're reading, and their comprehension, their ability to understand. So I look at all of that when I'm evaluating reading, um, and I'm looking at that in comparison to their writing and math skills as well, um, and trying to determine what are some of the underlying reasons that these difficulties with reading are happening in the classroom. Autism is something that is a 
kind of a completely different thing in some ways. Um, and often you'll see that people who are evaluating autism uh, to determine whether or not a diagnosis is there, that's a different evaluation than doing a psychoeducational eval. Uh, it still includes interviews and observation, and it includes a lot of neuropsychological testing to determine strengths and weaknesses, specific rating scales, perhaps a pragmatic language evaluation. Um, and then there's one test that people consider the gold standard for autism, and it's called the ADOS, the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule. You have to be specifically trained in that test to really be able to use it, but it is very subjective. Um, even if you are well trained in it, they often want two people uh, observing behavior at the same time during that instead of just one person testing uh, so that you can decide if you agree with each other. Um, but if children who have autism or who are suspected of having autism are struggling in the classroom, then achievement testing can be really beneficial as well because we need to determine is autism causing an educational impact in the classroom. Sometimes it does and sometimes not as much, so depending upon the, the child. Okay. So then outcomes of testing. So we're talking about creating a plan here. So what happens when testing is done? Well, um, you should get a report. The report should include everything that I sort of just talked about, a description of all of those things, uh, as well as any diagnosis um, that is included. This may not be included in the school report. They typically don't make diagnoses, at least in New Jersey that I've seen. In other states, I've seen it happen where there, there are um, people making diagnoses in the schools. Um, they're usually, in addition to the, the interpretation of all those test scores and all those descriptions, there's uh, some, an overall analysis of you know, what do we think is going on here? What are the strengths and weaknesses and what can we do about it? So recommendations for school and home and personal support um, are often included in a report. Again, I have not seen this in all school reports. Some school reports have them. Some refer to the meeting and they say during your follow-up meeting when you go over the results they'll talk about recommendations. Um, and then it may include resources like books or websites or things like that as well. So then what happens next? Once you get this big long report and have this meeting where you talk with the psychologist who explains everything that was done and explains what they found, um, then what do you do? Um, so when it's a private report, you might um, provide it to the general education teacher because it might have suggestions or recommendations uh, for what the teacher can do and also may describe or explain the diagnosis a little bit for the teacher so the teacher can understand what's going on. Um, it might help in terms of entering that RTI or MTSS process that we talked about or in New Jersey INRS. Um, if there's a diagnosis on the report and the child needs accommodations in school, they might be considered for a 504 plan so it can be provided to whoever the 504 coordinator is at the school. It's often the guidance counselor I've seen recently but sometimes it's not. Um, and then, you know, in some cases, uh, kids might be considered for an IEP or an individual education program. Um, and that would be determined by an IEP team. That would include people from the child study team or the school psychologist, uh, parents and teachers. Um, and you would have a meeting to discuss whether or not, you know, your child is eligible for special education services um, and uh, then go from there in terms of developing this IEP. You might also give it to other providers like a physician for medication needs or an occupational therapist or speech therapist or just a psychological therapist or a tutor. So in the case of a school assessment, we've talked a lot about that already, but I do want to point out that once you're in that IEP meeting, if your child is eligible for special education services, they'll have to determine what category that falls under. So there are a lot of different categories um, that children might qualify for special education under. Uh, you'll see them, some of them listed here um, and they might be called different things in different states and there are certainly other ones that I didn't list here but I wanted to point them out. Um, Kids who uh, have ADHD, and that's a specialty area of mine, if they qualify for an IEP, often qualify under this area called other health impaired. 
Um, at that point, you might also discuss placement. So it's important to keep kids in what we call their least restrictive environment. So as I mentioned before, it used to be that special, that special education was just sort of one room that kids spent all day in, um, but it's not like that anymore. And there's a wide continuum of services, starting with stuff that just goes on in general ed and going all the way to what we call a self-contained environment. And that's an environment where kids are just in one classroom all the time um, with a special education teacher. So in between that, if kids um, do qualify for special education, they might be in an inclusion class. This is sometimes also called a co-teaching class, an in-class resource uh, class, or a push-in environment. But basically that means that a special education teacher is in the general ed classroom with the general ed teacher. So usually there are two teachers. Um, and that special education teacher works with the students who have IEPs. And they might actually also help some of the other students in the class as well. Um, they might pull the children back to um, a table in, within the classroom and work with them. Sometimes they get pulled out of the classroom as well as part of it. Um, but they spend most of their day uh, with their general education peers. Another option is resource or pull out. So this is where kids are in general ed most of the time with their regular general ed teacher. But they get pulled out by a special ed teacher just for reading or just for math. Um, if they're in, you know, middle school or high school, they might go to a special education class for that period um, for whatever uh, specific area they have and then go to general education classes for other things like science or social studies. Um, and then, as I mentioned, self-contained environments are there uh, for kids who really need special education in all areas. Um, they might come out and um, participate, though, in specials with some general education peers like music or art, um, you know, and participate, obviously, in uh, recess or lunch. So there's other ways that kids can participate with other, uh, other general education peers. Um, in addition, uh, you'll go over any services, the curriculum that might be used, so specific interventions or specific curricula for that disability. For example, um, you know, uh, there are various different uh, interventions for reading disabilities, such as Orton-Gillingham or Wilson. So you might talk about that during your IEP meeting. Talk about what goals your child should reach by the end of the year and any accommodations that are needed in the classroom. Um, if interventions are not at the level, I'm sorry, if, if what's going on is really not at the level of an IEP, meaning that they don't really need special education services, um, but there's still something going on, then you would talk about what interventions will be put into place in the general classroom to help your child. Okay, so using the results as an educator, I think a few things are important to point out here. Um, one is that we need to understand the disability. We may not, this assessment may not change the placement of the student. They may still be in your classroom after this assessment. And we need to understand how this child's disability is affecting their behavior or their academics in the classroom. Um, you'll want to be aware of any accommodations or goals that have been put into place um, through the 504 or through an IEP. Um, we want to be aware of the fact that you might need to differentiate uh, for that child and provide something different in the instruction uh, for that child than for other kids in the class. And there may be other kids who need the same thing that they do, um, but we have to be prepared for that and try to figure out how can we change things a little bit to make this work for this child. Uh, and assignments might need to be modified, for example, um, or they might need you know, an oral check-in for their tests if they're not great with writing. Um, we need to talk a little bit too about the fact that the accommodations that are put into place and in the IEP are there to level the playing field here. A lot of times we hear the term fair. What's fair for all of the kids in the classroom? Um, and fair in education doesn't necessarily mean equal. It doesn't necessarily mean that everybody gets the same thing. Um, in education it means that everybody gets what they need to learn. Um, you know, many disabilities are not visible. You can't really see that they have a problem with writing or a problem with reading or a problem with attention. Um, and some of the things might appear to be bad behavior um, when in reality what's really going on um, is something that's harder for them to control. Um, so, you know, in the cases of, for kids who have these difficulties, we don't necessarily have one blanket thing that we can provide to everyone in the classroom that's going to help that individual child. For example, eyeglasses. 
not everyone needs them, right? So we're not going to give them to every child in the classroom just because one kid does. And this is sort of similar. Um, the other thing to really point out is just because I could do it yesterday doesn't mean I can do it today. Um, you know, I can run five miles maybe, if I tried really hard, um, and I could do it today, but then if you told me, okay, now that I know you can do it, you have to do it every day for the rest of this month, um, I might have a hard time with that, uh, being consistent with that, um, and so what we need to do is shape towards more consistent and better behavior. If I were to train more, then maybe I could run the five miles consistently maybe. <laughs> uh, but we have to keep that in mind that it's something that is more difficult for them. It doesn't mean they can't do it, it's just harder for them. And we really want to play to strengths. So, you know, as I mentioned, allowing oral uh, answers for kids um, who are really verbal but they have dysgraphia and they can't get it down on paper. You know, if they have really great verbal skills, using a scribe, using, um, you know, speech-to-text software, allowing oral answers, all of those things can really help them show what they know. Oh, and also, we definitely want to work and communicate with parents as an ally or a team member because a lot of times I feel like parents are feeling like it's going to be a fight with school, uh, that we're just going to have to fight really hard to get the things we need for our child in the classroom, um, when really it, it works the best when everyone's working together as a team for the child's best interest. Um, so explaining the process to your child. So one of the things that I want to point out here is that I avoid using the word testing when I talk about um, uh, the testing that we're doing. Uh, instead, what I do is I say, we're going to do a whole bunch of activities that tell us how your brain works, because each person has their own unique brain. Everybody learns their own way. Um, people learn differently from each other. Um, since you have a unique brain that's not like anyone else's, we have to figure out what works the best for you. Um, and then that we can help their teachers know the best ways to help them learn. Um, I also point out that a lot of the activities I do are fun. This is a one-to-one -one kind of testing situation. I'm not going to put them in a room for three hours and have them fill in bubbles. Uh, I'm going to ask them questions, then they give me oral answers. We'll put blocks together to make designs. We're going to pick out pictures that finish a pattern. Um, more recently I got some of my testing on an iPad which makes it woo, super exciting uh, for the kids. Um, it's not really as exciting I'm sure as Minecraft or other things like that but it does make it a little bit more likely they'll be okay with doing it. Um, and most of the school activities that we do are relatively short. We're not spending a ton of time with reading, writing, or math. We're just getting a taste of each one. Um, so it does, everything starts out very easy, but it gets harder as they go along because the tests go all the way up to college age. So I tell them, you know, try your best. If you don't know a word, that's completely fine. When I first learned to give some of these tests, some of the words I had to look up because they do try to give you more and more difficult things until you can't do it anymore. Um, we want to get a good night's sleep and eat before testing. Bring water, maybe a snack. Don't have a sleepover the night before testing if you can avoid it or things like that. Um, you know, we want to be at our best for that. Um, and then when you have results, uh, you know, you might want to know, should I bring my child to the assessment? Um, feedback, uh, if they're old enough, maybe. Uh, this is something that really depends on the kid. Some kids are very, very sensitive and hearing about any weaknesses they have in a, in a format that that feels judgmental, might be really hard for them. Um, whenever I do have kids sit in on feedback sessions, I really focus on the strengths. Um, and then I mention the other areas as areas that we just need to work on, and this is how we're going to help you with it. Most of the time, those weak, weaker areas are things that they already know they're having trouble with. It's not new to them. So they like to hear that it can get easier, that it can get better. Um, but please let the examiner know in advance if you plan to bring your child. Um, that way we can be prepared. A lot of times I don't show numbers, I don't show scores when I have kids in the room. Um, I'll do that if I have parents, but um, and it will be in your report, but I won't necessarily do that if I have kids directly in the room. Um, I also uh, try to connect um, whatever it is that we found to those areas that they know they're having trouble with. Um, that way, you know, we can 
they can connect like, oh, so I had trouble with listening and remembering stuff when I was working with you, and that makes sense that I might have trouble following directions in school sometimes. Um, I try to do that as well. Also want to empower kids to self-advocate. You know, it's not something wrong necessarily, but just that you do it differently. So we need to, fit, you need to know when you need help and why you need help and how to speak up and get those things that you need. Um, we also want to understand the positives of a diagnosis. So for example, kids with ADHD can be a lot more energetic, they can be really creative, they can think outside the box sometimes and come up with solutions to things that sometimes I'll just be really um, blown away by their ability to think of that and think, oh, I never would have thought of it that way. Um, that's one of the gifts of ADHD. Yeah, some of the things, other things aren't gifts in terms of forgetting to turn in your homework and, you know, having trouble with waiting to the last minute on your projects and having trouble staying quiet and having teachers tell you, you know, we got to keep it down, things like that. But teachers who know know that what the gifts of ADHD are, are able to work out times where you can speak to the class and talk about the things you're interested in and, you know, put you in a position to, uh, you know, be a leader and problem solve, which would be really great. So I try to focus on that as well when I talk to kids. Um, I do like to point out to them too that this is not an excuse. It doesn't mean you can't do something. It just means that it, it actually might take some more effort and some more work for you, which I know is really frustrating sometimes, but that's true of everybody. Um, you know, I'm uh, not a particularly great athlete, um, so if I were going to be able to do as well as everybody else, maybe just be able to do average, I would have to practice a lot. Um, whereas if the child is a great athlete, there maybe it comes to them so easily that yeah, they practice to get better, but um, you know, they don't have to do it quite as much as people who aren't quite as athletic uh, and gifted in sports. Um, so I try to point out those different kinds of um, strengths and weaknesses and, and recognize it takes practice, it takes effort, it takes work. Um, and it's not just something we can say, oh, I have ADHD or I have dyslexia, I can't do that. All right, so what's next for parents? You get all of this information and it can be very overwhelming you know it's sort of like a menu at a restaurant with all of these things and you're not sure what to do first so ask your provider to prioritize for you what's the most important step to do first here what's the first thing I should do um, the, your provider may have referrals for you for therapists or speech people or um, social skills groups or things and they can tell you you know these are the things I think would be most beneficial and in what order you should potentially do it we want to consider, you know, your, your the impact on your family. A lot of times, these difficulties that kids are having, it's putting stress on a lot on everyone. Um, and if they have a lot of activities and they have a lot of things going on, and now we have to add tutoring to that, and now we, you know, we have to do all of these things, it can become, you know, very overwhelming for everyone. So trying to look at the schedule and say, okay, well, we're going to pick specific things they really love and have them keep doing it because they need to for, you know, to, for their confidence and to enjoy things that they do in life other than school. But we need to provide some downtime too, um, you know, to, to kind of take a breath, take a step back and go, okay, you know, we can, we can get through all of this. Um, you might consider family therapy or even individual therapy for yourself if you're feeling like stress is high. You've got a number of kids at home and you're trying to keep up with everything and it can be overwhelming. Um, so you want to find support with other parents. Look for local parent groups or organizations where you can find other parents that are dealing with the exact same thing that you are and are able to commiserate but also maybe provide suggestions or provide referrals or programs or things that you might not know about otherwise. So in, in terms of that, some of my, the resources that I provide, depending upon the, the area of concern, um, I do like uh, understood.com, and I, I realize here that it has a different um, website there underneath, but it is just understood.com. Um, it's a great website for just learning issues in general. Um, so you can learn more about lots of different things, learning disabilities, ADHD, anxiety, school stuff. Um, a lot of that uh, that's on there I've seen um, has been uh, pretty evidence-based, has been pretty research-based, um, and has uh, explained it in a way that's un understandable. Uh, I guess understood.com is a good good name for it. Um, I also like uh, for ADHD the CHAD organization, Children and Adults with Attention Deficit Disorder. There's a national organization as well as local chapter. 
um, and they ha might have support groups or different presentations and things as well as recommendations for books, recommendations for services. Um, Decoding Dyslexia New Jersey, I love that organization. Uh, they provide a lot of really cool presentations in the area um, if you're part of uh, New Jersey. Um, if you're not in New Jersey, we also, or even if you are, uh, we also have the International Dyslexia Association which provides lots of information about dyslexia and about services and they keep a long list of tutors that provide um, specific tutoring for reading disabilities. Uh, for our gifted kids, I love Hoagie's Gifted. Um, and then if you're struggling with the legal side of things uh, in school and trying to determine what your rights are, rights law is a good site to learn more about special education law. These are some of my favorite books. Um, you can obviously read them here, but I want to point out this one in particular, What to Do When. So there are books called What to Do When You Worry Too Much, What to Do When You Grumble Too Much, uh, What to Do When Your Temper Flares, um, uh, what to do when you dread your bed. So these books are workbooks and they're good for kids to read with parents or with a therapist um, and it's what I do in cognitive behavioral therapy with kids um, but it's it's really kid friendly they can draw in the book um, some of them have neat little activities you can do um, and they really help kids and parents have a, a language to talk about these difficulties with but also um, really great really hands-on practical strategies. So I love those books and they're cheap on Amazon. You can pick them up. Um, so, and, and some of these others are just really great depending upon the, the need that you have. Okay, um, so I have some time here for questions. Um, I'm leaving this up here while we talk. This is how you would uh, contact me um, or uh, get an appointment for testing at our facility. Um, we also are running um, groups. I typically run uh, my organization uh, and planning group, TOPS, which is for middle schoolers or high schoolers. Um, I run that twice a year, um, so you can contact us for more information about that, as well as um, individual therapy that I do for organizational skills, uh, some parent training, and some cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, and our, our facility, we have some amazing therapists who do wonderful work with um, anxiety and OCD, um, depressive symptoms, and, and things of that nature. So they're, they're very, very good, and I enjoy working there. Um, so I'm open to, to questions at this point. All right. Well, I am open with questions, so I'm just going to jump right in here. And we actually have two questions that were posted tonight that are kind of similar, and they're both asking for what's the difference between. So I'm going to ask you them those back-to-back, -back, okay? Okay, sure. And, and you touched on all of these topics while you were talking, but I think a kind of a good explanation of exactly how they they interact with each other would be great. So sure. from, one present, or from one listener, what is the difference between psychoeducational testing and neuropsychological testing? That is a great question. Um, so psychoeducational testing typically includes um, a cognitive test like IQ, um, an, an IQ test or a cognitive testing um, and it also includes achievement testing in reading, writing or math um, and the goal, I mean and it includes all the things I talked about before, but the goal is really to determine what's what kinds of processing difficulties are going on that could explain um, an academic problem, uh, something in reading, writing, and math, as I mentioned. Um, whereas neuropsychological testing uh, typically focuses primarily on the, um, the, the cognitive piece and um, the processing piece with a lot of different types of processing tests. So we might look, be looking more in depth at memory, more in depth at executive functioning, um, those sorts of things. Uh, and a lot of times neuropsychological testing is used to address um, things like uh, head injuries and concussions, things like uh, autism, you, you'll see more neuropsychological testing. It may not include any achievement testing at all. Um, in some cases I've seen some brief achievement screening, uh, but the goal is more to look at a diagnosis that is neurological potentially in nature as opposed to um, academic difficulties. Okay, thank you. 
Excellent. So another question, can a licensed LDTC, and I'm not sure, learning disability, I'm not sure, would you tell me what LDTC is exactly for the audience? Um, so that's learning diagnostician. TC. LDTC. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the rest of it, but okay. it's like people who are learning diagnosticians or learning consultants okay. uh, in the schools. Learning disability teacher consultant. There we go. <laughs> okay. Um, so, can a licensed learning disability teacher consultant administer psychoeducational testing or is it only done by psychologists? So, an LDTC can administer educational testing, um, but uh, they can't administer IQ or cognitive tests um, or neuropsychological tests, but they can administer um, achievement tests. They often can administer some of the processing tasks that we look that we use to look at achievement testing. So, uh, for example, um, um, the CTOP, the Comprehensive Test of Phonological Processing, is something that I have seen uh, learning consultants administer when they're looking at a reading uh, concern. But um, IQ testing is uh, done by psychologists. All right. Would that vary, do you think, from one school district to another or from state to state or something like that in your experience? That that's quite possible. Um, the, the difficulty is that in most states there are no learning consultants. Um, Texas does have them, I know that for sure, uh, but most other states don't have that uh, category of professional. So the psychologist does all of the learning assessment um, and most school psychology programs train psychologists in assessing learning disabilities. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, with regard to the what to do books, what is the recommended age range for those books? Oh yes, good question. Um, so they range, I've used them with kids as young as five. Um, not all of them get it at that age, but some really do. Um, and I've used it with kids as old as, I'd say 12, although you're starting to get into they think stuff is baby, babyish at that point. Um, but I've still had some kids at that age who still like it. So um, I would say that's the general range. I'm sorry, what was the, the range again? Did I you have, just repeat that? The widest range really is from 5 to 12, but I most often use it with kids maybe like 6 to 10. Okay, so you're probably in elementary school then, basically, for that. Most of the once time, they, yes. Although once they... early middle school, I still use it with them all the time. Okay. All right. Um, have a question about, you were talking about assessments. Um, who decides how broad an assessment will be? Like who makes that determination what things are going to be covered in an assessment? I think that depends on who, in what setting that assessment is being done and who's administering it. So in a school setting, uh, the decision for how broad the assessment is going to be is partially done really by the IEP team. Um, so when you have the initial meeting to sign paperwork that yes, the school can assess your child, um, they will recommend, you know, these are the types of assess uh, pieces to the assessment we want to do. We want to do a psychological, which might include uh, IQ and behavioral rating scales and observation. We want to include a learning assessment, uh, which the LDTC will do. Um, we want to, they might want to include a social case history where um, the social worker uh, does a lengthy interview with parents and maybe an interview with kids, um, possibly teachers, um, and uh, you know whether or not a speech uh, assessment is needed or OT or PT or whatever else is needed, um, that's determined by the team at that time. Um, and if it's, a, if it's a private psychologist or if you're in a state, um, you know, where there's a school psychologist but not the other pieces of the child study team, um, the school psychologist may themselves recommend this is what I want to do as part of the battery. Uh, the private psychologist also will say this is what I think is necessary based on the concerns that we have here. Um, but, you know, sometimes I'll have um, parents or teachers specifically ask, you know, can we assess for this or that. Um, and I, I try to be honest as, as honest as I can about what I can assess for and what I can assess for. Um, you know, there are certain things that aren't part of my um, 
wheelhouse as a psychologist and I would recommend that someone else do that. For example, any speech testing or OT and auditory processing disorders are most often diagnosed by audiologists. Okay. On that same in that same thinking though, how is a parent supposed to know what to what accommodations might be appropriate? Somewhere in your presentation there was a there was a mention about you know the the parents' role in determining the um, accommodations, and and some parents who are not new to this process might have a tough time even knowing what to suggest. So whose responsibility is that? Does that fall on the school to say the there's an array of these five things if you have a speech problem, or five things if you have a reading problem? Like who's supposed to know that? Um, okay, well, in, in terms of the, the overall accommodations, um, there are certain things that are considered, quote, accommodations that might be included, like on a Section 504 plan, something that might be included in general education. Um, and there are sort of set ones that people have been using for many years, and you'll see those, you know, it may be in the report from the person who's doing the testing. Or, the, or would be recommended by the school. Those are the things that I mentioned, like preferential seating, extra time on tests, things like that. But the basically, what kinds of accommodations are needed or what kinds of services are needed? So if you need specialized instruction in reading, if a child needs um, you know, specialized help in, um, in speech, those particular things are determined based on the assessment data. So the information from all those interventions that may have been in place, the information from the assessment, then leads us to, well, what accommodations are needed? What is the teacher already doing? What kinds of things should we do differently based on this child's disability or based on the specific things they're doing in the classroom? Um, but you're pointing out something really important, and that is that schools have limited resources. Um, so they may not have every possible curriculum um, that that kids could possibly use uh, for reading at their disposal or someone trained to do every kind of intervention um, that's out there. Um, so they might have, you know, these are the things that we currently have people trained to do. Um, and most schools try to provide as wide a range as they can within their district um, of those types of, of services. And, you know, they try to match up what which services are needed for which issue so if a child has dyslexia or has a as a reading disability what kinds of curriculum do they have do they have Wilson do they have Orton Gillingham do they have some other kind of curriculum that would work better for that child's specific disability um, and they suggest those things uh, typically in the IEP meetings um, you know and parents can do some research on those things either through some of the resources I mentioned or organizations that I mentioned to find out more um, but sometimes there are, there are services that can't be provided in, in a, uh, the public school setting that they're in. Um, and some kids who have very, very significant needs then are sent um, outside of the school um, to, a, to a different placement um, at the expense of the school. Uh, we call it an out-of-district placement that sometimes is done if they can't provide what's needed in district. Um, but as you mentioned, how do people know this? We try to use the assessment data to figure that out. Okay, because again, if you're coming into this new, it's um, it's a little overwhelming, I think. It is. It can. Um, it I, definitely can be. I have someone going back to the a, a question about the definitions, and um, this this listener wants to know that if a learning consultant can give a Woodcock Johnson four cognitive and achievement test. I would say that I can't say for sure what the legal, you know, what is considered legally possible in New Jersey. Um, in, in my training, psychologists were the only ones who could provide the cognitive tests. In other states that I've worked in, that was the case. Um, and so I'm, I'm really unsure in New Jersey whether there is a legal reason that you cannot um, provide that or whether it, whether or not people are trained in giving the cognitive, um, the Woodcock cognitive, I mean. Um, I, I'm not sure that I can answer that question. I could find that out, though, mm -hmm. and we could do that. Uh, we could hopefully answer that on the blog. 
Oh, that would be great. Then we'll make sure that question gets posted. And if you could look into that, I don't know where the listener is from, so that further mm -hmm. complicates it. Um, let's see. We've got time for one more. Okay. Um, there was an. This parent saw an article recently on the value of recess. And she's interested in your thoughts on that and what difference it makes in a child's day in the classroom. I'm a big fan of recess. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, honestly, if you thought about sitting at your desk in your job all day long, um, focusing hard on whatever it is that you needed to do, um, if you have a desk job, if you're lucky enough to be able to be out and about, maybe it's better. But um, you know, if you're in a classroom where you're just focusing and you're working as hard as you can, and you're you're doing things that are hard for you for a long period of time, you need a break. Um, and you know, I do feel like recess has sort of shrunk over the years. Um, mm -hmm. And there are even some schools that will then use recess time as this is the time you have, the extra time you get for your tests, um, which is crazy to me um, that you would then, you know, that's something that's often used as a punishment, taken away from kids, you know, if they're not behaving in the classroom, oh, then we're going to take away recess, so it's used as a threat, and then here it is being used as an accommodation time for extra time on tests. It doesn't make sense. Um, but, I mean, the research does show that, particularly for kids with attention problems, that exercise is really important um, and can really help them um, focus better. It can, it can also improve mood. Um, and it's also an important time for socialization. Um, you know, kids maybe get to do some structured things in the classroom with each other, but they might not have as much time to just, you know, play independently with each other, um, you know, and not under a structured game or something like that in PE. Um, so I do think recess is very valuable and for a lot of different reasons, um, and I do wish that there were more, there was more time in the school day for it. Okay, well, fair enough. I couldn't agree more. And on that point, I'm going to wrap it up here. I just want to mention to you that um, I sent you an email, so I'd like you to check that as soon as you get a chance to get when you get offline, okay? Okay, I will. At that, at that point, I'm going to wrap it up here. Thank you very much. Really great presentation and a lot of really valuable information. I'm going to turn this over to Kelly to do a wrap-up. Thank you for joining our webinar on um, solving the puzzle, creating a plan for success through psychological and educational testing. There is an exit survey which we need everyone attending to fill out. The webinar blog is now open and available for the next seven days on the NJCTF's website for any additional questions that were not covered in tonight's presentation. That website is www njcts.org. Also, an archived recording of tonight's webinar will be posted to, the, to, to our website. Our next presentation is on grief and loss and handling um, the expectations. Is presented will be presented by Jesse Bassett and is scheduled for October 18th, 2017. This ends tonight's webinar. Thank you, Dr. Ahern, for your presentation, and thank you, everyone, for attending. Good night.